And these words that, that Chris is going to preach is, is from God. You know, God has given the, in these words. And so uh, <clears throat> yeah, we, we know we're going to get blessed today. I'll just pray for him. Oh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that um, Chris will um, give out your word today, Lord. And it will be a word for us to take into our hearts, Lord. And our, 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 um, for us to um, believe and for us to uh, meditate on. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hey Amen. Good morning to you all. Nice to see you all. Hope you're all doing well. Okay. I, I, I need to apologise and prefix this. Normally, when I, I do a sermon and stuff, I like to go into the Bible and you know and uh, teach on the Bible and things. Uh, when I was, I was praying in the middle of the night because again I woke up around four o'clock in the morning. There's nothing else better to do at four o'clock in the morning, is it? Um, so I was just praying and I was saying, Lord, you know, what does it want me to talk about today? And um, if that would give me a couple of scriptures to talk about. Um, and again, I'm really sorry. Uh, so if you're guest here and you've never heard me preach or anything before and you're like, what, what is going on around this place? Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today, is, and I don't normally do this, is, is very prophetic. So if you're not prophetically wired, then I apologise in advance because this might freak you out. But if you are prophetically wired, then this will be good fun for you. Um, but this, what I'm going to talk about today is is very um, of, of, it's very personal for me as well because this is something I've been tracking with for about 15 years and uh, it, it's, it means a lot to me. And so I'm going to share some things today which are very deeply personal from things that I believe God has shown me uh, in respect to his church and, uh, and I'm going to have to prefix it with a little bit of theology to start with so you understand where I'm coming from. Okay, so you're right, I know you're all thinking, now, what is he going to say? Uh, what is he going to do? Um, so if, you, if you've got a Bible, we turn to Haggai chapter 2 and uh, verses 1 to 9. So Haggai chapter 2 and verses 1 to 9. So you all know the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay, so it's about the rebuilding of the walls and the rebuilding of the temple. Um, and... There's this bit where they're rebuilding the temple. Uh, I don't think it's coming out in this scripture here. It comes out in Ezra, I think, or Nehemiah. They're rebuilding the temple. And obviously it doesn't compare to the first temple, which was Solomon's temple. Now Solomon's temple, uh, on estimate, they reckon was around about between $40, $60 billion worth of gold were ornate all inside. So all the walls were uh, embroidered with gold, everything. The whole thing was just gold. It was like the ultimate bling, okay, in the Middle East. And it was very expensive, it was very lavish, it was very beautiful. And so when this second temple was being built, for all intents and purposes, it was just lots of blocks on top of blocks. And yeah, it looked like the temple of old, but it it didn't compare to the temple of old. And so I think it's in Ezra and Nehemiah. There's all these people are like, people shouting and screaming because they're rejoicing. Yes, the temple is being built. But then there's also a lot of older people who are mourning and crying because this is like, this does this, this is nothing compared to what it once was. And so there's this prophecy here. And it's in the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai saying, Speak to um, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? I mean, a few people are like, Yeah, I did. How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? All right, so even the prophet, even God's like, This doesn't compare to the original. All right. Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come and I'll fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. So it, he's basically promising that even though this temple looks pretty dag compared to the original one he's saying yet even so its splendor and its glory will far outshine 
the previous. So this is God's encouragement to the people like, keep building. I know what it looks like. I know it's looking a bit plain, but yet this temple will be greater than the former. Okay, so that's the, that's the promise there. And that's basically what I'm going to be talking about today. The latter will be greater than the former. And it's really a prophetic message for the church for today. Now, I'm going to have to get into some stuff to, before I talk about these visions that I, I've had. And for instance, for, for example, some people here might think, visions, dreams, this guy's crazy. Uh, yeah, I probably agree with you. But these visions and dreams have literally saved lives. Uh, in 2006, I had dreams and visions that saved 250 people. I was, did stuff with the United Nations to get them our village out, and it saved them. I helped the Japanese consulate find the train when um, the Japanese tsunami hit. Um, I, I had uh, an angel appear to me in 2008 who told me this date of the stock market crash three months before it happened. Okay, so um, <coughs> yes, my life's a bit weird. Right? It's not like most people's. But time and time again, the things that God has shown me do seem to come to pass. Okay, So I'm not saying, therefore, I'm right and that, that's it, deal with it. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that there is a, a, a certain, you know, you can take what I'm saying seriously and you weigh it and test it and do with it as you please. Now, one of the things that you see in Old Testament prophecy is, for example, two prophets immediately spring to mind. You've got Ezekiel and Hosea. Okay? Now, Ezekiel had a wife who was a prophetess and she suddenly died. And within that was a message to the people of God. Hosea, he was a prophet of God. And uh, I'm not, not saying that I'm a prophet of God. I'm just giving you the, from the Old Testament. So, so Hosea, he was a prophet of God. And he had to marry a prostitute. You all remember the story? Yeah? Okay. And so in that, in that situation, the prophet, Hosea, for example, was um, acting out the place of God in, his, in himself and the harlot wife was basically acting out the, the people of Israel. Okay, So it's a genuine metaphor with deep prophetic overtones that mean something very, very important. So if you've got a Bible again, hopefully the same one you just read a minute ago, we're going to turn to Ezekiel 24. And this is just the theology I need to prefix with here so you know where I'm coming from. So Ezekiel 24, verses 15 to 7, 27. Um, actually, I won't read all this, but basically it, it's saying uh, Ezekiel's wife, he comes home and she's died. And, and God says to the prophet, don't, don't, don't mourn for her, don't grieve, um, just go around and try and act normal and, uh, and mourn for her silently. And, uh, and it says in verse 24, thus Ezekiel shall be assigned to you, as in Israel, you shall do just as he has done. When this comes, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, and it basically says, as she was taken away from you, so the temple will be taken away from you. Because obviously it, for these people in Ezekiel's book, they're all in exile, and the temple was destroyed. And that they too would then walk around mourning for the loss of the spiritual epicenter of their faith. Okay? So again, the prophet here, uh, it can represent God or it can represent the people. And the wife represents either the people or it represents the temple or something else, okay? Are you all with me so far? That's quite easy to understand, yeah? So the prophet represents something, the wife represents something, okay? This is, this is the two patterns from this. Um, so in 2009, I, I had a, a really peculiar dream that, I, that I, I knew was from God, and, and it's one of those dreams that actually showed me my whole life already mapped out, which is a bit freaky because I didn't realize that's what it was at the time. And um, I'll just go through some parts of this dream. So in the beginning of the dream, um, so this was in 2009, so that was about 15 years. Is that 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah good. my math is on, on it. So two, 15 years ago. And um, in this dream, I was on a farm. And uh, at the time, I was like the lowest of the low. I was just like this little laborer because I was thick, didn't know what I was doing. And so like, you just do the general work, you know, clear out those troughs and stuff. And so I just got given all the late, all the nonsense jobs, and, and I was being quite abused by certain people, you know, for, for, for my lack of knowledge and stuff. And then, as I was walking forward down this road, there's this winding track, and so I came round this this track, and there was this corner point, and at this corner point was a deer, and then a funeral pyre, then a house, and then I, that was gave me a sharp left turn, and then I had a sharp right turn, and then there was this clear straight path before me. Now, in this clear, straight path before me, as I was walking down it, suddenly my wife came out to greet me with her son. But my, this wasn't my wife, but she was my wife, and she had blonde hair. 
But I was like, my, my wife's a brunette. What's going on? I actually was dumbfounded in the dream. I was like, this makes no sense. Why am I looking at a woman with blonde hair? And that's my wife when my wife is brunette. I don't get it. But anyway, I was caught up in the dream. I had to follow through what the dream was showing me. And as I then walked past her, or she walked with me, I then walked past these three huge houses. And there was these three power cables that were attached to me in some way. And, and this is a part of a ministry of reconciliation to try and bring the three houses back together again, which is the Orthodox, the Catholic, and the Protestants. Good luck with that, Chris. And so trying to put them three back together. One of them was not playing, playing ball, and so an angel came along and he cut their power cable so they could have nothing to do with it. And then as I walked on, um, this is now towards the end of my life because the, the path was ending. And in the, in the distance, I could see these big columns of fire and pillars of smoke. And I knew that that was the end of days, the, the, the return of Christ. But I also knew where I was at now in the dream, revival was imminent. And then suddenly these wings grew on my back like that of an angel. And, and as I started worshipping and praising God, this fire came down from heaven and it hit me and I just caught fire. I turned around and I touched my wife and she caught fire. It was good fire, by the way. It's not bad fire. It's like, ah, burning! It wasn't anything like that. And she caught fire. And then she touched my son and he caught fire. And then they just started touching all these people on the farm. And they all instantly started turning to fire. And they just spread this fire. And it was like a revival fire. It just spread absolutely everywhere. And, um, and so that dream really kind of, if I'll be honest with you, messed my head up for quite some time. Because I was like, what? What does that even mean? That's, I mean, that's a riddle of riddles, that one. It just makes no sense to me at all. I mean, who's the blonde-haired woman? What does that mean? What does it even represent? Um, that really kind of troubled me for a while. And then I started getting a series of other dreams about the blonde-haired woman. Now, I'll explain who she is in a minute, okay? Just, you just have to go along me because you're going to have to sit there and figure this out like I had to. And so... Over the next several years, and I was getting these repetitive dreams about the backstory to this blonde-haired lady. She was a woman that had been rejected by her husband, and she was out in the country, because obviously we were living on the farm, and then she was being rejected by all these people all the time. Rejection, 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 rejection. And then, and then she was placed in, in kind of like, oh, yeah, you can have her then. And I was like, what? what? And I was like, well, she, I don't know what the problem is. I mean, she seems nice enough. But why is everyone rejecting her? So I was a bit, I didn't really trust her much. So this is like the backstory that's going on. Um, and then, and this kept going on. I said more and more details about this blonde-haired woman. And, uh, and one of the key things that I knew about this, this woman and what she represents is that shortly after that marriage comes, a little bit further beyond that comes revival, true revival. Now, I don't care. Some people might say, I don't believe in revival. Where's that in the Bible? Well, there's loads of revivals in the Bible. What they mean is, is at the end of time, there'll be a great falling away. So how can there be a great falling away and a revival at the same time? Okay, what well, it says in the book of Joel, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, i.e. the end of days when Jesus returns, because that is the day of the Lord, okay, he shall pour out his spirit on all flesh. It all shall prophesy and all this kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, but Chris, that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Was it? Did the sun go dark? Did the moon go dark or blood red? Um, was it the day when Jesus was about to return? Was it at the end of the age? Or was it a partial fulfillment of that prophecy? Okay, so it's a partial fulfillment because the context of that passage is about the end of days when God is going to move by his spirit. So you can have apostasy and revival at the same time. Can you? Give me an example. Okay, the church here in the West is in apostasy. The church in the East is in revival. Okay, so it, it's not one or the other. You can have both at the same time. And indeed, when God is really moving in his church in power, there are those that tend to resist it and resist it and want nothing to do with it as well. Um, so I had this, as you know, this riddle with these two wives, and um, this is the kind of the sad bit. So in the dream, another series of dreams, my former wife, which is the brunette wife, um, which, um, it, she died, and she died of a mysterious disease. And in the dream, someone said, how did your wife die? And I said, oh, she, desired, she died of some strange disease, that's all I knew, some strange illness. And God showed me this other dream, because obviously these two women represent the church. That's, that's the riddle, okay? The church as she is, and the church as she will be. Uh, and so, in the dream where she was dying, I saw this scene of Great Britain, and every, every house in Britain had this kind of cancerous stuff that was growing, and it was like a white, foamy, sizzling stuff. 
and it was just eating up all the structure of the houses. So there was no cure for it. There was no way you could stop it. So every single structure, every house which represented the churches, every house in Great Britain would be destroyed by this fizz. It was just le- literally eating the superstructure of all the houses so they all collapsed. And some of this stuff fell on me, and it was uncomfortable, but it didn't do anything to me. So it doesn't harm people, but what it does do is it harms the institution and the structures and the way that we, and the culture and the values that we think church should be done. It completely destroyed it, so that it was completely gone. And then only when it was completely gone could something new and fresh come from that. And so I always knew in the dreams that the passing of the brunette wife, um, she would die, and through her death would come the other one. And it's a bit like, again, sorry using a, a pagan reference here, but like the story of the phoenix, when it dies, even out of its own ashes, something new and fresh comes. It still looks similar to what came before it, but it is obviously uh, a new bird, so to speak. Now, this is the bit that's a little bit controversial, if that wasn't enough already. Um, but again, so I've, I've been praying a lot into this. And, uh, and so I was praying, and I felt God was saying that the death of the church as she currently stands, or the death of the brunette lady, will be with, not within one year, but not within years. And I had another dream many years ago. Again, these are all years ago, when I was aged 56. I'm now 52. And when I was aged 56, I was married to the blonde-haired lady. Now, I'm not talking about me getting married, but this is, remember, it's the dream. It's like the prophets of old. They represented something, and their wives represented something else, okay? So God or the people or what have you. And these dreams are, are the same. And so by the age of 56, I was then married to this new church, this blonde-haired lady. And so the thing that I got was not one year, but two years, passing away. Then the church come back, remarried within one year. And by the age of 56, this new church will be established. When I say a new church, I don't mean like the body of Christ has died and then it suddenly comes back as something else. Because the body of Christ is, is, is the body of Christ. It's eternal. But I think it's to do with its culture, its values, the way that we've been doing things for... I don't know, for the last 50 years. And there's, and there's something really important, which I'll get to a little bit later, about why the church as she is cannot cope with what's coming, and therefore she needs to become a new wineskin to cope with that new wine. Even though old wineskins contain nice wine, seasoned wine, okay? But not this new thing that's coming. Um, and another thing about these two wives, that they're very similar to each other in many respects, but they also look different, they feel different. Oh, I don't mean like feel different. I mean they look different and they are different, but there's certain core values that are the same. And this, this brings it back to um, Haggai again, where people were mourning over the loss of the former temple. I, I have literally, because what you don't understand is these aren't just dreams for me. I am actually emotionally tied into these things, like it feels like I am married to the brunette, and I'm married to this woman in the future. And it sounds wrong, it sounds weird. And so when I, when I think about the brunette wife dying, it just fills me with mourning. It actually makes me cry. It breaks my heart, because that's what's coming. The brunette must die. The church, as she currently is, must die. Because she, not that, when I say die, I'm talking about the culture and the values, not the people. And that, that, that as things stand, it must come to an end. And that which comes out, the blonde-haired woman, she's obviously younger than the other one, so therefore she lacks the wisdom and lacks the, the, um, the depth that the other one had, but she's like a fresh wineskin and that she is able to be flexible enough to deal with the changes and the situations and the circumstances that are coming just prior to, I believe, a revival at the end of days. The other day when I woke up, I heard the audible voice of God and he said to me, Chris, you're on a farm. So I don't hear the audible voice of God very much. I've probably heard it only about a couple of times in my whole life. So that was like, what? And then it just reminded me, it's about that dream. It's about the dream of the farm, you know, where everything's about to change. I'm about to hit the funeral pyre, which is where (laughs) the brunette dies and the first part of the church dies and comes a serious left turn and then a sudden right turn. And that's when things uh, change. And so... The parable of the old and the new wineskins is that we're coming into a season where 
we, we've come, a lot of us here, we, we love church as she currently is. Some of you might not like her very much, but she is lovely. So just to go into a, an analogy which the Catholic Church uses, which I really like and the early church used, is that the church is your mother. Okay, so if I think of the church as my mother, just for a minute, when I was 17, I got born again. It was the church that, that let me drink of her spiritual milk. It was the church that then gave me more nourishment. It was the church that brought me up in the faith, that matured me, nurtured me, uh, then grew me up into a man and one who could then lead the church as well. Okay, so taking it back to the metaphor of the wife being married to that, it's like, Everybody here has something to be grateful for, for what the church has given to them in their lives. Everybody here. You know, from things like the charismatic renewal, whatever, the, the culture, the tradition, the values. Every one of us here has been impacted by church, either in a good or a bad way, but it has given you something that you should be forever grateful for. And I think that's in part for me why these dreams are so sad, because when you see the, the end of that, when it comes to an end, there is a loss, there is a sadness, there is a mourning for that which so impacted our lives, that which so sheltered us and was a part of our lives and was so good to us and kind to us must surely come to a close. And uh, I remember in, in other dreams that God's given me where people would be saying in the world, where did the church go? What's happened to it? Because buildings closed down and things happened. You might think, what could cause those, those sort of things? What could cause it? Well, I mean, we had a similar thing. Three months before COVID hit, uh, I had a word of the Lord, uh, and it said, he said that something was coming that was going to shut the church down, that all of the churches in the UK was coming that would shut everything down. And I had no idea what that would be. And several months later, then COVID hit, and it shut everything down. So if you're thinking, how can something happen that would cause what I'm saying to happen? Well, it doesn't really take much, unfortunately. And something is coming, and I believe economically is, is the major influence why that's what's going to cause it is through economic uh, issues in our nation. It's going to cause a lot of churches to close. Um, some of that in judgment, some of that because the church isn't awake and fore or, forewarned or for or for prepared for any of it. They're just not prepared. The church is asleep, the church is blind, she doesn't know what's coming. She thinks she's dressed and clothed and can see well, but actually she's blind and she's naked and she doesn't know it. Yeah, and the church is asleep. And so, the old temple, great former glory. She was beautiful. She was lovely. And she had the wisdom and the culture and everything that we once loved. But then that has to go. And like old wineskins, the wine from that old wineskin tasted so good. But now it's time for some new wine. And nobody likes to drink new wine, do they? Oh, some of you might, I don't know. But uh, nobody likes to drink new wine because it's not as, it doesn't have the body. The old, not that I would know, this is what I've been told apparently. So the old wine has more body uh, and new wine is more sharp. And so who would want the new wine? But it's in the new wine skin. It's the new bride, the new wife, so to speak, the blonde-haired woman in my dreams. She, although younger, she's in a place where she is prepared and flexible enough to go through what's coming, to adapt culturally and to adapt her methods and everything else so that she is in a place that when God pours out his spirit, she'll just flow with it. Whereas I think the church in her current state, if it was filled with the power and the glory of God the way that I've seen it on many other visions and dreams, she just wouldn't be able to be able to work with it, wouldn't be able to handle it, just would, would destroy her. And I think this is in part the reason why we've got to go through what, what's coming. I want to share just briefly what revival looks like for the things that I've had. And again, you might not believe in revival, but God is immutable. This is a theological fact. God changes not. He is the rock. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God does not change. Okay? I don't care whether you're an old covenant, you know, new covenant. It, God does not change. He is always the same. That's a theological rule of faith. God does not change change. And that's why it's called titles like The Rock, because The Rock never changes. If you go and see a mountain 2,000 years ago, it'll likely look exactly the same as it does today, okay? Because it does not change. And God does not change. So why am I laboring that point? Because if God has done revivals, both in Israel, national revivals, and we've seen revivals of Christianity throughout history as well, if God has done it historically, then why do you think he wouldn't do it again? 
Why do you think it, they, whereas we're coming to the darkest time in history, which we're not there yet, but we're certainly getting there quick, why do you think that at the darkest time in living history that God would suddenly go, yeah, I'm done here now, I'm just going to sit upstairs and just watch this thing just play itself out? Or do you think God would do, as it says in Luke 21, as it says in Matthew 24, the greatest signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth at the end of days than any other time? Why? Because it's a wake-up call. Hello, wakey, wakey. The end of days is coming. Jesus is coming back soon. The Antichrist is coming soon. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to live your lives? Are you going to carry on as you are? Or are you going to change and you're going to you know, sort yourself out? Because Jesus says in Matthew 25 that we are to continually watch and pray. But the church today isn't watching. She might be praying, but she isn't watching. She has no idea what's going on in the world right now uh, and the, some of the signs and the wonders that are going on in the nations. has no idea. And neither when you say it to her and you show them to her, like, oh, oh, that's just nonsense. No, no, God doesn't do that anymore. That's Old Testament. God doesn't do blood red rivers and all that nonsense. They don't do that anymore. That's Old Testament. God's, God doesn't do it anymore because he, he's new covenant God now. Okay, And so new covenant God is a new, improved, shiny God that wasn't in the same as the one in the Old Testament. Now that's blasphemous what I'm just saying because that's what Christians think. Yeah, They think, well, God, it, the Old Testament's like the age of law and now we're in the age of grace. Well, where does it say that in the Bible, that you're in the age of grace? Well, the cross is only relevant to those that believe in Christ. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life and not perish. Okay? But then it goes on to say in John 3.17 and it's 18, that those who do not believe in him are condemned and they've condemned themselves. So that means the grace is only relevant to those that believe in Christ Jesus and the power of his cross. But it's not relevant to anybody else. And also when you read the book of Revelation... Go figure, God's exactly the same when he returns as he is at other points in history, biblical history, where he smites nations and does these things, okay? So God has not changed. The problem is, is with our theology and how we're looking at the world and the lens of which we're looking at the world, we've got these really nice, like, grace goggles on. It's like, everything's so nice and gracey, gracey, gracey. But actually, no, God is speaking to his church in these days. The church needs to be ready. The church needs to be prepared for the signs of the times and the hour in which we're in. And we need to be spearheading what's coming, not be behind the curve. We need to be on it. We need to be with it. Because if we're not, we're going to get caught up in the wave that's coming. And there is a wave that's coming. And it's coming. I mean, you don't need to be prophetic or anything. You know something's coming. Anybody sat in this room or out there, I could tell, I could speak to an unbeliever and say, do you think something's coming? Can you feel it in the air? And they go... Yeah, it's going to rain, mate. No, hopefully they would say they would know that something is coming. I, I've got some unchristian, uh, unchristian friends, and they all, they all know it. You know, I got I know some guys. They're like, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm like, what? I'm just going to get out a massive big bank loan and spend it all because we're not going to be here to pay it back anyway. And I'm like, well, I really wouldn't go, but you know, they're kind of on the right track. Not with debt, of course, but but with the idea that something big's coming. And hey, what's the point anyway? That, but the Christians haven't got that sense. They're just like, oh, well, it's just business as usual, church as usual, we do our thing, we go to church on Sunday, blah, 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 and not aware of what's going on in the world. And so, really, this was the point of today's sermon, is that, and it's, I know it's a weird one, but it's what I felt God say to talk about, is that the glory of what's coming, even though it will look smaller, even though it will be younger, even though it will be diminished, what it will do will be greater than anything that you've ever experienced, that you and I have experienced in church history, that we know from church history. What's coming when this church is ready, she'll have a different mindset, a different philosophy. Uh, obviously, our theology will be the same, but there'll be something about her that will have a different spirit, a fighting spirit, one that will be there so that when Jesus starts to move by his spirit, be like, whatever you say, Lord, let's go. But where the problem is with the church at the moment is if God did really move in supernatural, like big power, we would try to contain it. We would try to uh, merchandise it. We would try to make it a thing about leaders. We would try to stick our name on it. We would try to put our logo on it. But what God wants to do is like, no man, you get your hands off it. I want a people who are submitted to me that will bend the knee to me and their lives will be, Lord, what is your bidding? I will do it. I've submitted my life to you. I'll go where you go. 
I'll, I, you know, whatever you want me to do, that's what I will do. That's the people that Jesus is looking for. He's not looking for empire builders. He's not looking for superstars. He's looking for humble people like you and me that are just like got that attitude. God, whatever you want, your will be done, not my will be done. Amen. And I believe when the church comes out of this period over the next four years and when we come back up out the other end, then I believe we're going to see something quite incredible in the church. And the thing that, you see, the thing is, we've got to go through some tough stuff. You've got to go through the tough stuff. Who wants to go through some tough stuff? All right. Now, I would never put my hand up to that, but I understand that it's through the crucible of, 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 uh, of intensity of persecutions or whatever, you know, that, that troubles and afflictions. It's through that place is where we get the depth of character. It's through that place where people get changed and transformed. It will either break you or even make you. And I believe that in what we're coming into as a nation is going to be the very thing that will break the church but also make the church. The very thing that causes her demise will be the very thing that causes her kind of like rebirth into what God wants to do. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I praise you, Lord God. And uh, Lord, I pray that I've managed to make, help people make sense of what's coming. But Lord Jesus, I just pray, give it into your hands, Lord God. And uh, for all those watching this on YouTube and stuff, Lord, I pray that everyone will take this word, that they will hear it and they'll weigh it, they'll test it, they'll pray for it, Lord God, and see if it's right, if it's from you or if it's not. And Lord Jesus, if, it, if they believe it is from you, that Lord, help us all to respond in a way that's right uh, and according to this word. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.